Hello, welcome to Shaka Extra Time, a show that comes to you live every Tuesday. Today we are coming to you via Skype, uh, broadcasting from our homes. Uh, due to the coronavirus, uh, we've not been able to do the regular programming. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. Welcome to this uh, special edition uh, of uh, Shaka Extra Time. Good to see you too. It's an honor to be back on your show. How are you? I have to tell you, frankly, that uh, I remain simple, easy, and as some of my fans have suggested, an awesome son of Africa. I haven't seen you in about a month, and I have to say you look uh, remarkably, remarkably good. I don't know what you've been up to. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, I have to say, frankly, that uh, the feeling is mutual. And remember, Paul, I say this from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kabale heart and soul. Thank you so much. A warm welcome to you all our Facebook followers are watching us live. Shark Extra Time is a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And today we'll be talking about uh, coronavirus and uh, its impact uh, this far. Let me begin by asking you to give us an assessment of uh, where things are. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, a coronavirus? It doesn't look good, man. Uh, if you look, for example, at uh, the United States of America, which is supposed to be the only superpower, and therefore should actually be taking the lead because it has the moral responsibility, it is not even taking care of its own people. The coronavirus is very devastating. And yet, when you think about it, Paul, what is interesting about this particular enemy, it does not have respect for borders, boundaries, race, social economic status, different neighborhoods or ideologies, gender, religion, nothing. It's just looking for flesh. Yeah. And yet, for some strange reason, we are still far away from taking advantage of it in the sense that it provides us a great window of opportunity to realize that for the first time, we are a huge human family and that we should in fact be there for each other. Because guess what? It doesn't care really about the differences that we exhibit. It should be a great opportunity for us to know that this is the moment this is the time for us to hold each other's back. That's the only way we can go through this. Uh, Shaka, you make a good point uh, that uh, our coronavirus has shown us that uh, at the end of the day, we are all one uh, human race uh, and uh, coronavirus doesn't discriminate. As you clearly can see what is happening uh, here in the United States, uh, what, happened, what has been happening in Italy and other places, uh, things have been really, really bad. I wonder uh, what, uh, going forward, if this thing continues, uh, if this virus continues to uh, devastate uh, us as a people, devastate economies, what is going to happen to the global economy? Some economists and commentators are talking about uh, a recession. In fact, the International Monetary Fund, I think, has come out of the gate to say that we are actually facing, if not experiencing, a re you know, a recession. But you know what? There are other voices, in fact, which are saying it is far worse than that. That, in fact, we could very well be on the way to a depression. And you know what the depression means? That means that the world will pretty much turn about, really, turn around, probably, to the extent that there are a lot of people who not only will be affected, but will lose their lives, not only because of the virus, but because they will have nothing to take care of them. They will not have the medicine that they need, even though, as we talk today, we, we, we have yet to actually get, a, you know, like a vaccine. We have yet to get some effective therapies, later on a cure. And then we are talking about food, 
ndiho. We're talking about the basics, really. If the economy comes to a halt, what are people going to eat? And if people do not eat, what is going to happen to them? Uh, a lot of people have been talking about that. Uh, for Personally, I've been home, including you. You've been home for about a month uh, now. And uh, uh, luckily for us, we are in a situation or we are in a place where we can uh, easily sneak out and go and maybe buy groceries. But there are people, uh, a lot of people, especially on the African continent, who can't even move out of their houses. They can't move in their, you know, out of their houses for, and yet we are actually being told that part of the way in which you can effectively fight the virus, short of a drug, short of a vaccine, is through social distancing. Now, how do you begin to talk about social distancing in the Africa that you and I know? Africa, or Africans for that matter, pretty much culturally belong to extended relationships. You know, it wasn't an accident, for example, that uh, a former American first lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton, wrote a book whose title was It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. You know, it actually takes that same village, Paul, that same community to sustain life among the people of Africa. I remember when I was young growing up uh, in Kavari, southwestern Uganda, I used to have the, you know, my grandmother, the great Sarah. Sarah would sometimes be cooking and suddenly realize that she, does, she actually has run short of salt. And she would ask me to go to the neighbors so that I can get a sort of, quote-unquote, foreign aid mm. of sorts in order for us to eat some tested type of food. <laughs> now, how, what do you do in these types of circumstances where you are being told, stay away from one another? You have so many people sleeping, in fact, in a very small room. That's correct. We eat together. We basically drink together. And sometimes we actually even use the same type of clothing. When you think about it in the context of uh, Africa or Africans dealing with a uh, coronavirus, uh, nobody has ever seen anything like this. Uh, yesterday I was talking to my dad and uh, he was just telling me that uh, uh, they can't even move or interact with their neighbors. And those communities are built around interaction with their neighbors. You just referenced uh, your, your grandmother, Sarah, who used to send you to your neighbor's place for salt. This is how Africans have survived for a long, long uh, time. Uh, going forward, how this is going to impact our relationships across the continent, or even relationships here, especially when people are enforcing the social distancing uh, 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 guidelines that uh, a lot of people are saying that maybe they have made a difference. Paul, life will never be the same again. You remember the issue of 9-11, you know that since then, it is no longer a luxury. You do not no longer look forward to going to an airport to get on a plane and fly to somewhere. The reason is very simple, because you basically have to be forced to go through some security process, a process that almost dehumanizes you. Now, this corona business is not going to allow us to go back and continue doing business as usual. The world and life is going to have to change. Mm. But I hope that when it changes, it changes in the context of knowing, as I said at the outset, that we are a huge human family, that we need each other. We need to hold each other's back. So... The good thing about this virus is that, in fact, it has the ability to empower us if we can gather the courage and the wisdom to be able to unite so that we can take it on. How would you respond uh, to critics uh, who say uh, that, uh, for example, the United States, the only superpower, has somehow uh, failed to uh, address uh, or tackle this uh, and uh, there were warning signs 
a lot of people have been talking, commentators have been talking about how the U.S. ignored signs. Uh, when you look at uh, lines of people, this is something that uh, you would not think of, especially uh, happening to America. People lining up to be uh, tested for coronavirus or people running out of hospital beds. Uh, how would you respond to critics who say that maybe the U.S. government uh, did not respond as it should have? It has exposed the United States and especially the federal government leadership. As a matter of fact, when you think about uh, the efforts by the local governments, city governments, and the states, that is where the leadership so far initially came from. In fact, there are a lot of people who have been watching some of the briefings conducted or carried out by New York Governor Andrew Como, they have actually been saying, this is the man. This is the man that seems to be leading essentially the fight against the coronavirus, not only in the United States, but globally. Yes, there have been some weaknesses and what have you, but I hope that the government will step up so fast so that it can make up for what it lost, so that at the end of the day, it can restore its status of being the first or the leader globally. Because as you said earlier, it is the only country on this planet Earth which has the distinction of being a superpower. Eyes of the world are basically pretty much looking at Washington to deliver. Yeah. Because this is a city, as you know, where some of the decisions which are made affect all of us globally. There are some uh, mixed uh, reactions here. Uh, a lot of people, there are people who I've talked to, people that I've met, uh, people in my neighborhood who think that uh, the administration has done uh, a phenomenal job. Uh, uh, yes, uh, they were slow to react, but uh, when the thing hit, they, uh, they put on their boots and ran as fast as they could, and they, are, they have been delivering as far as they are concerned. You can talk about the economic lifeline. You're talking about uh, slightly more than uh, $2 trillion to help people that have lost jobs, to help people that cannot pay, for example, as a result of losing jobs and what have you, cannot pay their rent, cannot pay their mortgages, cannot sustain a livelihood. Mm -hmm. The economic stimulus, some might call it, in fact, an economic lifeline. Yes, that has been done, but it remains to be seen first and first of all when it is actually going to be distributed, delivered. Even though, as we talk today, I heard that uh, the initial dollars have actually been sent out by the IRS to those people who filed the, you know, for the uh, their taxes. 19, I mean, 2018 uh, and 2019, right. that those people should fi feel very comfortable uh, to access their checks through their accounts. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other people, millions of other people, whose addresses are known and what have you. And moreover, we don't even know how long we are going to stay in this particular situation. So yes, the government has obviously tried and it is a good thing, and we should commend it, but it is simply needs to do much, much more. And as the Speaker of the House, uh, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, at one time said, what is mainly needed as we talk is three words, testing, testing, and testing. Before ah. you can actually do that, and you know exactly how far the disease has traveled and who it has affected and where. It is going to be very difficult to find solutions to adequately address it. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I was talking to one expert who said that uh, maybe perhaps uh, the reason we're not seeing a lot of uh, uh, cases in Africa, most countries don't have the capacity to taste. And uh, uh, maybe speaking from uh, uh, a great example here in America, it wasn't until uh, there was massive uh, tex uh, testing that we started seeing a lot more cases uh, 
uh, coming to uh, coming to the forefront. Uh, could this probably be the case in Africa? There is not enough testing being done that uh, we see a few cases. Oh yes, uh, I think uh, you are right on the money because, as a matter of fact, uh, when you think about uh, a country like South Africa, which is uh, an African country but um, is an industrialized country. It has a lot of advantages uh, uh, which are very different from a lot of its you know, peers on the continent. It has been running in two situations where it is discovering that so far, when you think about how many people have been affected, it seems to be very safely in the number one position. And part of the reason is because it has the capacity to test mm. for the virus. A lot of African countries, I am told, do not really have the capacity. In fact, I was talking to a foreign minister from a country I am not going to name here in Africa, who told me they have actually, they actually ordered for some of that equipment and they are waiting to receive it in May. Can you believe what is going on wow. since the virus started its rounds so, so, until May. So that and means a lot of countries about, were not prepared. Yes, and then you, and then you talk about, uh, for example, the ventilators. There are a lot of African countries that do not have ventilators. As a matter of fact, it is interesting that uh, I was looking at some reports which actually suggested that when it comes to the ICU beds, we're talking about the beds that are very needed for people that are very badly affected, that a country like Uganda, where you and I come from, it has more cabinet ministers <laughs> than ICU beds. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, no, really. And when you think about the, you know, the health care facilities across the continent, it leaves a lot to be desired. Even when you think about the health care givers, we're talking about the nurses poor here. Mm. We're talking about the doctors here. Can you imagine how many thousands of African nurses, of African doctors, who are basically working here in North America, working in Europe, and working in Africa, but in South Africa? Mm. Can you think who is going to be you know, taking care of the victims of this kind of virus. It's, you know, it's really going to require a lot of wisdom, a lot of courage, and it is going to really require a lot of attention from African leaders at all levels. Mm. They need to be able to focus on this virus as if, in fact, they were focusing on the virus like a laser beam. And you know, you can talk about social distancing, which is a good thing. Mm. And I commend a lot of African governments have actually done that. Right. The problem is, yes, you can actually order people or instruct people to do social distancing. But what about food? What are they going to eat? Most people, it's hand to mouth. Uh, Precisely. They, As they, a matter of fact, some people were being interviewed, young people. They were being interviewed, and they said, we are actually going to die of starvation. And yet, we are being told that we are actually having to stay in our houses for the safety of our lives, because we have to stay away from the, the coronavirus. But we are going, in fact, to die from lack of food, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think that these governments really need to figure out a way of putting in place some kind of social economic lifeline. Uh, yeah, you should appeal to the international community, like the United Nations, for example, and what have you. They should figure out a way of approaching the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, these Britain Wood institutions, at least to put a hold on their loans so that they can get, gain the capacity to figure out a way of supporting their people because they don't have the money. When I step out, I wear a mask just to protect myself, to protect my family. I wear gloves. 
Uh, but do you think uh, this kind of thing uh, is a measure that is effective? Or uh, in our African context, uh, really, it doesn't work? In terms of culture, we are extended sort of, you know, we are an extended sort of relationship type of culture. We do almost everything together. But then when it comes to the hygiene, that also is a huge problem. As a matter of fact, it's the mother of all problems. Because when you talk about water, that you should be able to wash your hands almost every time you touch something, and you wash it with soap. Can you imagine in the context of Africa, the issue of water? When I was a kid, Paul, before my father, John Wilson Mshakamba, got the capacity to pull water into his house in Kavale, I used to go to fetch water. I would come from primary school, at Shikunjiri Primary School, and I would carry, you know, like a team. I would go about a mile and a half in order to reach some source of fresh water so that I could take it home. And then, of course, the family would cook the meal and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There are so many African families which are like that. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, how Chinese are responding to African uh, diaspora or African uh, Africans living in uh, uh, China. Uh, we've been uh, reading news, uh, seeing reports of uh, Africans being treated badly in China. Uh, what's your response to that? It is not uh, unusual that uh, in times of uh, crisis, certain communities tend to somehow think that their problems are not of their own making that their problems have actually been brought around by people who are coming from somewhere else. So people feel so insecure in those type of situations, and they begin to look for scapegoats. In this particular situation, the Chinese, I, I understand, wrongly go to the information that even though we think that this virus, in fact, came from China. And there are even uh, some United States officials who have actually been referring it to as a Chinese virus. Even though the World Health Organization says you should not really call this disease as anybody's virus. It is simply a virus. It could have come from anywhere. But some of the disinformation that apparently spread in China is that Chinese actually believe that this virus came from an African animal and that Africans, in a sense, when they look at Africans, they think they are looking at the symbols of the coronavirus. This is not the first time. And yet, there are also some other theories that this actually coronavirus may in fact have come from a Chinese laboratory. It may have come from a Chinese laboratory. They may have been doing some experiments, which obviously would be a reflection, perhaps, of what they are looking at in terms of, or in the context of, what they would consider vital national security interests. I hope that, again, this creates a window of opportunity for Africans to think in terms of removing these superficial boundaries and borders and speaking with one voice. Perhaps uh, African leaders uh, should also reach out to the Chinese government uh, to uh, maybe put out public statements that uh, coronavirus did not come from Africa. To all those places where uh, there are a lot of uh, Africans, uh, people are literally taking matters into their own hands. Uh, landlords are evicting uh, Africans. It doesn't matter how, if you've paid for a year, two months, or six months to a year, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I listened to some interviews where these girls get on a bus or on a train and every Chinese gets off because they're afraid they're going to catch coronavirus from Africans. Uh, when you look at it from the perspective of uh, China being the biggest investor on the continent right now, shouldn't this worry them? Because if it keeps like this, uh, at the end of the day, 
uh, the businesses in Africa might suffer. The way they are treated in Africa might change. No, you're right, Paul. But I think we should also be very, very careful here because uh, under no circumstances do you really think that what is happening in China is a government policy. Of course I not. I do not see yeah. any evidence suggesting that this is a government policy. Of course These not. These are individuals yeah. who are taking the law in their own hands. They are like vigilantes, so to speak. Again, because they are feeling so insecure. They are feeling so insecure and they are looking for essential scapegoats. But I think what the African leaders need to do, in addition to what you just requested them to do, African leaders at home and also African diplomats who are representing their countries and live in the capital of Beijing, they should definitely approach the Chinese government so that it can appeal to their people to stop doing the sort of things that they are doing against the African people. Shaka, uh, we're almost uh, out of time, uh, but uh, uh, briefly let's talk about uh, uh, the controversy surrounding uh, uh, the boss of our, uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, people who are calling on him to resign. There are uh, people who have threatened his life. He's publicly come out and uh, said that uh, his, his life is in danger. Uh, he gets death threats. And uh, a lot of people are saying because he's an African, he's not up to the task, that he's inept at what he's doing. Uh, do you buy into that argument? I have seen no evidence whatsoever suggesting that uh, the man in charge of the World Health Organization is incompetent. That the man in charge of that organization does not have the qualifications that one needs in order to occupy that office. As a matter of fact, yes, in order to get that particular appointment, one could say it is political. But even in the context of politics, it is an open competition where, in fact, you have to chosen by a board that is made up of professionals. There is no question that the gentleman has the requisite qualifications. Unfortunately for him, he happens to be living in a neighborhood, in an office, in an orbit, where people of his skin color are very rarely expected to be. And whenever Africans have had an opportunity to be in those types of boardrooms, they have become, they have come under tremendous pressure from the international community. And this international community, especially some segment of it, somehow thinks that it has the sense of entitlement. No matter whether you went to the same schools, and you actually have better degrees. Mm -hmm. They have a feeling that your skin color limits you to a certain degree. I should probably conclude by suggesting that uh, if you happen to be a black person in that type of position, one thing you should know is that in order for you to succeed, you have to be able to jump higher. You have to be able to run faster. You have to be able, at whatever you do, to focus like a laser beam. You cannot leave any margin of error. Thank you so much, Shaka. You're most welcome, Paul.